Greetings. I'm Paul Erickson, Bishop of the Greater Milwaukee Synod, and I'm so pleased that the Synod staff and Synod Council are able to provide these video worship experiences for the congregations of our Synod. As we work our way through these late summer weeks and prepare for a fall unlike any we've experienced before, our hope is that the preachers and worship leaders can take a week or two off from the challenges of figuring out how to provide worship experiences online and outdoors and in ways that few of us could have imagined just a few months ago. I'd also like to offer a brief word of thanks to all of you. Not only have you figured out how to worship, connect, and serve in these unusual times, you've also been exceedingly generous. Our recent financial appeal held jointly with our partners in Outreach for Hope resulted in over $90,000 being raised uh, for Project Lunchbox, providing food to families impacted by the pandemic, and for a COVID-19 relief fund, offering grants to congregations and ministries responding to the challenges in their communities. These funds have strengthened our ability to be the church in new ways in these changing times. And additional stories and videos of the impact of these gifts are located on the Outreach for Hope website at outreachforhope.org. 
You've also maintained your support of our work together as the Synod and our partners in the ELCA and our global companions in Tanzania and El Salvador at levels very close to previous years. These gifts allow us to focus on connecting with and supporting pastors and deacons and congregations as together we strive to follow Jesus, form communities, and love all. Thank you for being church together for the sake of the world. We now begin our worship in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Creator God, you have claimed us as your children in the waters of baptism. You have called us to be your church, loving our neighbors and serving all of creation. And you have created us in your image, distinct in our gifts and experiences, and united in our desire to follow you. Challenge us, strengthen us, and lead us as we walk the path that is set before us. Not knowing exactly where it leads or how long it lasts, but only trusting that we do not walk alone. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. We believe that we are claimed as God's people, diverse in our identities and experiences, but united in our call to love and serve all creation. We believe that in the midst of challenging and uncertain times, we are not alone. God is with us and we are connected to each other in countless ways. We believe God is always up to something new. Our task is to stay curious and explore where the Holy Spirit is moving us. We believe God is inviting us to explore new ways of being the church, so we might experience the full life God intends for all creation. We believe Jesus' command to love God and our neighbors is the heart of who we are together. We are the church, Christ's love for all on earth. Together, we follow Jesus with curiosity, courage, compassion, and collaboration. Together, we form communities through worship, prayer, listening, and invitation. Together, we love all, so we who are blessed will become a blessing. We commit to our common witness because, because Christ first loved us. We are the church, better together. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body, we have many members, and not all members have the same function. So we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Prophecy in a proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, 
but others, Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The Gospel of our Lord. Grace to you and peace from the God of all steadfast love and endurance. Amen. 2020. What a year. When we turned the calendar to this new year and this new decade some seven plus months ago, few of us could have imagined all that would take place. Oh, we knew it was going to be an election year and much of our national attention would be consumed by the often divisive and combative nature of the political ads and the debates and the conversations leading up to November 3rd. We now know that a few scientists were aware of the novel coronavirus appearing first in China, and they may well have wondered if this would turn into the global pandemic that they had been warning, of, warning us of for decades. But I think it's safe to say that no one really knew how this would play out. I also think it's safe to say that that the racial injustices and stark inequalities of our systems of law enforcement and education and economics and healthcare have been known and experienced by countless folks for generations, but I don't think anyone could have predicted the ways that the killing of George Floyd in late May would, would spark a, a global movement for justice and reform. It seems that the events of this year are fo forcing us to focus, some might say with 2020 vision, on the challenges and injustices and inequalities that have long been with us and too long ignored. The Apostle Paul writes, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you might discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Paul invites us to take a step back, to not get swept up by the swirling currents of, of chaos and confusion and conflict and change of our present age, so that we might find a space in which our minds could be renewed and able to discern the unchanging and ever-present will of the God of love. Well, this certainly seems to be one of the biggest challenges of this year, and any year for that matter. How do we discern the will of God? How do we know what to do and who to listen to? As we wrestle with the decisions about how and where and when we are going to worship and learn and connect and serve in the coming weeks and months in the midst of this seemingly unending pandemic. As we reckon with the ways that we as the whitest denomination in this country have actively supported and quietly condoned policies, beliefs, and behaviors that have perpetuated racism and white supremacy. And as we move into this election season, trying to identify and elect the leaders who will guide our country into an uncertain and unstable future, it is easy to become quickly overwhelmed by the sheer number of voices and experts and opinions and facts that we are being bombarded with. 
Now, we've been trained to believe that there is a right answer out there somewhere. And if we can just figure out who the right expert is, or who the right leader is, or, or what the right prayer is that we need to offer up to God, we can then find the solution that will solve all our problems and allow us to return toward normal lives, whatever that means. Of course, deep down, I think we all know that life doesn't work that way. And that any solution that is quick and easy is rarely trustworthy. So, what are we to do? The Apostle Paul, after inviting us to step back from the swirling currents of this world so that we might discern God's will for our lives and our world, he then urges us to embrace two simple yet life-changing values. Humility and community. First, Paul writes, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. In other words, we need to remember and realize that none of us is smart enough to figure this out by ourselves, and none of us are so important that our voice carries more weight than others. Paul then continues with an invitation to remember that we are a part of a community of believers. He writes, For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we, who are many, are one body in Christ. And individually, we are members one of another. We belong to each other. We need each other. And we need to slow down and take the time to listen to the voices that are all too often ignored. Now, it's striking to me that as Paul strives to give us the wisdom we need in order to discern what is the will of God, his invitation for us to remain humble and to remember that we're a part of our community might make things a little worse, at least on the surface, not better. I mean, if none of us is smart enough to figure this out for ourselves, and we're supposed to listen to everyone, how will we ever know who is right? How will we ever know and be able to decide what we're supposed to do? Well, fortunately, even though those who assigned the weekly readings in our lectionary chose to end today's epistle reading at verse 8, Paul did not end there. He kept going. Go ahead and read the rest of Romans 12 uh, when you're able to. And in the portion that is assigned for next Sunday's reading, beginning at verse 9, he writes, Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. This sounds a lot like what Jesus was talking about when he reminded us that the greatest commandment, the greatest commandments are to love God with all our heart and all our mind and all our strength and to love our neighbors as ourselves. That's how we know how to sort through all the conflicting and confusing and competing claims on our attention and our loyalty. That's how we know what to say and what to do. Is it born out of and does it help us deepen our love of God and our love of neighbor? It's not about my rights or my freedoms or my needs or my fears. It is always and only about how I can better love God and neighbor. And if what I say or do or what I don't say or do is somehow contributing to the pain and fear among my siblings who are part of the same body of Christ that I am, I need to stop. Listen. Repent. And change. This is the only way that we will find our way forward 
amid all the overwhelming challenges and confusing decisions that we are facing these days by remembering that we belong to each other and we are all accountable to the God of love. On Sunday afternoon, August 23rd, I'll be participating in an event called A Day of Repentance and Solidarity regarding the sin of racism and white supremacy. This is an ecumenical and multicultural gathering of folks in person at the State Fair Park Grandstand at 3 p.m. Masks and social distancing required. And it will also be viewable online that day as well. This event will be an opportunity for white Christians from a variety of communities and traditions to humble ourselves, to recognize that the sin of racism does not just harm our black and brown siblings, but it harms all of us. And we need to listen, repent, and take one more step on the long road of reconciliation and healing. This event on the 23rd will be followed by an opportunity to engage in, in Bible studies and conversations and a sermon series on the history and legacy of racism and our call to move in a new direction. For more information, I invite you to go to the website at weraceahead.com and take the pledge to become an anti-racist individual in an anti-racist church. Coming to believe that this year, this 2020, could be a major turning point in the history of our church, our country, and our global community. The question is, to whom and to what will we turn? I pray that we will turn away from the voices that seek to fan the flames of fear and division so that we might turn to and follow the voices that are calling us to humility, reconciliation, and love. Thanks be to God. Amen. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the
Gracious God, your healing power is everywhere about us. Strengthen those who work among the sick. Give them courage and confidence in all they do. Encourage them when their efforts seem futile or when death prevails. Increase their trust in your power, even to overcome death and pain and crying. May they be thankful for every sign of health you give and humble before the mystery of your healing grace. In your name, great God of mercy, hear our prayer. Claimed as God's people, we enter the kingdom from different gates. We are gay and straight, Democrats and Republicans. We are an eclectic collection of colors and traditions. We are people of the trades and we are people of the office. We are homemakers and home builders. We are people who speak multiple languages and we are people who speak only one language. We are artistic and musical. We are the vulnerable and we are the strong. We are the church. Bring us as your people from our vast backgrounds safely to the table where we find our common ground in the baptism we share. May the bond of grace be stronger than the enmity of strife. Great God of mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly healer, we pray for healing of the divisions in our world, our churches, our families, our communities, our country. May we all be one as you and the Father are one. Grant us hope in this broken world. Great God of mercy, hear our prayer. Uniting God, we are congregations in cities, small towns, farmlands, and suburbs. We are different in race and heritage, in age, physical abilities, gender identities, and sexual orientations. We have different views of our political world and different financial resources and educational levels, and yet you make us one. When differences threaten to make someone other, give us eyes and hearts to see your face. Gather us as the Greater Milwaukee Synod to be your one people of justice and peace, finding strength together to do your will and share your love. Great God of mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we pray for your church. We pray that during this time of COVID and this new normal we are in, that you by your Holy Spirit refine our churches so that we redefine our mission and ministry. Guide our steps on this new path, that we embrace it, that we are challenged by it, and that we are renewed through it. Great God of mercy, hear our prayer. People of God, remember that you are indeed claimed by God. You are God's amazing and beloved children. So go in peace, serve the Lord, know that you are indeed blessed. Amen, amen, and amen.